All right. So uh, this is our first lecture in Thermo 2. We're in Chapter 7 on exergy. This exergy is a lot like energy, isn't it? It's spelled a lot like energy. Okay, how many people are very familiar with the term energy? All hands go up. You spent the whole semester studying energy so far. We're going to spend another semester studying energy and thermodynamics and the transformation of energy between forms, etc. So why did they make a word for a new property, exergy, that looks a whole lot like another word that, you know, it, the, wouldn't it be confusing? Only one letter difference? Isn't that possibly very confusing? Why did they make, why did they introduce a term, exergy, which is so easily confused with another term, energy? Well, it was on purpose because the terms are very, very similar. So I'm going to ask for a brave soul who doesn't mind possibly getting embarrassed in front of their, and there's only a few in this room, because they, they, they have to be really brave. They have to have a strong constitution. They won't melt if I, you know, tell them, well, that's thank you for participating, because I'm going to set you up. Haven't you seen this before? I'm going to set you up for a wrong answer. So I'm going to ask somebody, you studied energy. Can somebody volunteer and give me the definition? There's my trap. The definition, in your own words, of energy. We have a brave soul. Thank you. Not today. Not, not today. <laughs> energy, come on. Yes, back here. That is the perfect definition of exergy, the ability to do work. Well, then, what is energy if exergy is the ability to do work? Energy, how much money did you pay for your textbook? Too much? <laughs> it was a lot of money. Was it over $100? It was over $200, wasn't it, the list price? All right. Somebody says, I read and studied that book so much to get to Thermo 2. I put time and effort, everything. And all we did was study energy, 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 and all in Thermo 1, a whole semester. Find the definition of energy in your textbook for me, please. Guess what? I laid another bear trap. You ain't going to find it. Hold it. How can an author write a whole book about energy, thermodynamics, and never really define energy? Hmm? <laughs> well, they have a definition, but it's fallen out of uh, use because it, the definition leaves you like, kind of like, really? That's the definition of energy? That's kind of blase. I like a definition like it's the ability to do work. Ah, oh, that's exergy. Energy is basically the ability to have an effect. What? Oh, if, if, if you want to make something hot, well, that's just energy, transfer of energy to make it hot. That's have an effect. It's not making doing work though, right? So energy is a broader concept. There's, there's a heat transfer associated with energy and energy transfer, and you have the change in internal energy, which often we think about changing temperature of a system or object. So anyway, look it up. You can look it up. Most of the time, if you find a definition for energy, it is the perfect definition of exergy. And every now and then, somebody will be brave, and they'll give you a pretty good definition of energy, but it's so broad, it's almost useless. The, ability to, the system has an ability to have an effect on another system. Huh? There you go. So anyway, we're going to study this new property called exergy. We're going to first do it for a closed system, then we're going to do it for an open system. Isn't that just like what we did for when we did... You know, Thermo 1, we did energy transfer. We did it for a closed system first. And we were introduced to this new property, U. And then we did it for an open system, and there was a property, H. Hey, what was the name of the property, U? Internal, Internal energy. What's the name of the property, H? Enthalpy. And then why did we have these two different properties? First law, you say... That U shows up, and then another time you write the first law, an H shows up. I'm really confused, Professor. Well, it goes back to an open system and a closed system, where you have flow either across a boundary or not across the boundary of the system. All right. We're going to have the property exergy. And uh, there's the symbol for exergy. Now, the book may say that that symbol for exergy is not italicized or italicized. I can't remember. But it looks a whole lot like another property, 
introduced, I think, in chapter 2, which was energy. They, they used the same E for energy, but they try to make it different in the book when you visually look at it, but I think you have to have very good eyes, better eyes than me to really tell. Is that italicized, bold, lowercase e, or just a normal, non-italicized, bold, lowercase e? I like it. I think somewhere in the book they have, well, pay attention, and when you see an e, it's really the context. You really have to know if you're talking about energy in this equation or exergy in this equation. Previous versions, they had something like lambda. You need another lambda in your life? Well, they got rid of it at about the third or fourth edition of the book. And they used to not call it exergy, they called it availability. And that's an older term for the same concept. It's that portion of the work, I'm, I'm sorry, the portion of the energy of the system which is available to do work because that's what often engineers are very much interested in, doing work. Having a system, often with the heat transfer in, and a workout. Then we're going to go back and uh, look at efficiencies and revisit the definition of efficiencies for turbines, compressors, pumps, even heat exchangers. But now we're going to have what they call either a second law efficiency or an exergetic efficiency. Different books use the same term or different terms. Hey, did we already do efficiencies of pumps and compressors? Yeah, what type of efficiency were we introduced to? Isentropic. Isentropic. This is a little different. The numbers will be similar in magnitude, but they'll be a little different in magnitude just because the definition is different. Okay, so we're going to have this exergy. We're going to have an exergy for a closed system. It'll just be E. And then for an open system, we're going to have E subscript F. All right. Somebody says subscript F. I got that down. I passed thermo 1. I really know my thermo 1. And we had U sub F. We had V sub F. We had S sub F. We had H of F. That subscript F means, on these four terms, means Saturated liquid. It's for the saturated liquid. The internal energy, the specific volume, the entropy, or the enthalpy of the saturated liquid. But guess what? Let's take a look. This is the blank X or G with the subscript F. It's the flow X or G. I just am trying to point out some of the problems that you may have. Like, what is that F doing down there? Is that my exergy for saturated liquid? Nope. It's my flow exergy for an open system, <laughs> like enthalpy. All right, let's jump into it. I'm going to derive exergy for a closed system. I'm going to get the derivation of exergy. So what do we do? Think of this blue system here. It's our system. It's a chunk of matter. It could be three kilograms of steam or whatever. It's at a given temperature and pressure. Think of those as two independent intensive properties. They fix the state of the system. You know, I could go and get the internal energy, the enthalpy, the entropy, the volume in specific volume. I could get a lot of other pieces of information about my system knowing just temperature and pressure. Now, we're interested in getting the maximum work out of that system. Okay, well, it's going to be a closed system. It's going to undergo a process. And at the end of the process, the difference between, you know, during the process, you're going to get some work out. That's traditional analysis. So we're going to have a first law analysis of a system undergoing a process. But to get the maximum work out, it's not by itself. The system has to be discussed in terms of the local environment. And this is really different from what you've been exposed to. And that local environment is characterized by a different pressure and a different temperature. There's a subscript zero on that temperature and a subscript zero on that pressure. So T naught and P naught mean the environment conditions, temperature and pressure. All right. So what will happen is, is 
if a system, think of it conceptually, is hot and under high pressure, me as a clever engineer could probably design a system such that it would extract the maximum amount of energy out of it as it undergoes a process in communication with the environment. But at the end of that process, if I really got all the energy out, that system is pretty well dead. And it's going to be in a state of thermal and mechanical equilibrium with the environment. So the initial temperature and pressure of the system are different than the final temperature and pressure of the system. When it finally gets to equilibrium, the final temperature of the system is the environment temperature. And the final pressure of the system is also the environment pressure. If you got that, we're off to a good start. <laughs> so you can write an energy balance for the system. Look good? Coming out of thermal one? No problem. Maybe you want to put E2 minus E1, or 2 is final state, 1 is initial state, but or just look, the energy, initial, final. What is Q, sis? It's the heat transfer into the system during the process. What is W, sis? It's the work out of the system. Then we think about it. You know, the work can be combination of both boundary and what we call useful work. So the red shown right here is if the system actually expands, it's going to be pushing back the environment some, expanding into the local environment. That's a boundary work. And if there was a shaft that sort of cut across and came outside of the combination of the system with its local environment, that would be the useful work. That's what we want to maximize to get out of the system, WC. I wonder why they put a subscript C on that W. It's up there on the slide. It's because they combine system with its local environment. When we talk about exergy, we have to talk about the system and the environment together. Okay. So let's go ahead and talk about what is that change in the energy of our system? Well, does this look familiar? Well, it's a change in internal energy change in kinetic energy, change in potential energy. The initial state and the final state. Professor, why is it U naught minus U? Because the final state is the internal energy of the final state is when it's in equilibrium with the environment. Does that make sense? Yeah. And why is it the kinetic energy zero at the final state? It's gotten to the dead state. All right, so when you're looking at the final state as the dead state, try and keep this in mind. You have the system initial state characterized by temperature pressure. You can go get the vol specific volume, internal energy, en entropy, the kinetic energy, potential energy. And the system at the final state where it's now in equilibrium with the environment, equilibrium with the environment, and then I can look up the specific volume at that T-naught, P-naught, and the specific volume of my, or the internal energy of my system at that T-naught, P-naught, et cetera. Now, if it's at the what they call the environment, then it's dead. You, it, you've gotten all the work out that you can. Essentially, it's like I am at the end of the day laying on the couch. I'm dead. There's no kinetic energy, and there's no potential energy. So you can strike those terms. <laughs> out of this equation right there. And then what about that boundary work? Well, you're pushing back the environment. Isn't the boundary work equal to the integral P dV? And it's pushing the constant pressure P naught back. Oh, I love that integral. P naught comes outside. It's just a change in the volume. Does this, hopefully that all makes sense too. So now I can rewrite that first law. It becomes this. It simplifies what was on the left-hand side of the equal sign. We still have the heat transfer into the system during this process. That hasn't changed. I'm going to work on that in a second. The boundary work and then that useful combined system. Think of it as shaft work out. All right. That's what we want to maximize. So we've exploited the first law. We go to the second law. What's constant? T naught. That's our environmental temperature. It's like... Um, the environment, why do we have it not just one for the universe? Well, because if you go to Alaska in the middle of winter, maybe T-naught and P-naught are a little different, especially T-naught, than uh, 
somewhere in Florida in the middle of summer or Texas in the middle of summer. So the exergy of the system depends on the local condition. But I can go outside in San Antonio in the middle of August and I can try to do all sorts of gymnastics and blow hot air out of my breath into the air. It's not changing the temperature. True? And the same thing is as you think of your power plant running up in middle of Alaska in the middle of winter, it's really not having a big effect, a negligible effect on the local temperature of the environment up there. Okay, so T naught and P naught are constant, regardless how much heat transfer into the environment or out of the environment or how much you push back the environment. All right, so we can write the second law for the system. Does this look familiar? And this makes this, this, this entropy transfer with the heat, the integral of 1 over T del Q. If the temperature at the boundary, which is the T naught, is constant, that makes a very simple uh, entropy transfer with the heat. And so that's the, probably the hardest part right there It's for this uh, equation. And then sigma. Hey, what was sigma? I can't really, you know, what is sigma? Entropy generation during the process. Um, if you have a completely reversible process, what is sigma? Zero. zero. If you have a lot of irreversibility, sigma is going to be greater than zero. Hey, when can sigma be less than zero? When can sigma be negative? Never, never, never. That would be a violation of the second law. You can't destroy. You can only generate due to irreversibilities more entropy. Okay, so we use the second law to eliminate Q cis out of the first law. So you just take and rearrange this, substitute, and you have a new equation for WC, little algebra. You can now start to read this equation. Look at this work out of the system is related to the change going from initial to final, initial to final, initial to final change in properties like kinetic energy initial, potential energy initial, and then I have this negative T naught sigma. Can T naught ever be negative? Maybe the temperature uh, T naught is uh, negative 20 degrees C. Can T be negative in this equation? Can I put in a negative 20 and will that equation work? Ah, no, 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 contrary. You learned that in Thermo 1, didn't you not? Anytime you have this second law, what has to be this temperature? This temperature. Absolute. absolute. It has to be. Can you ever have an absolute temperature less than zero? No, it's impossible. I know. We don't like that. We don't like to hear that that's impossible, but it is. So T naught will always be positive. How about sigma? We just talked about that. It'll always be positive. It'll never be negative. So two positives will always be positive. You subtract off something. Guess what? Any irreversibilities do, they're going to minimize the workout. So here, if I want to maximize the workout, let sigma be equal to zero. That means there are no irreversibilities. That's kind of a double negative. So you say it's reversible, no double negative. And you have the maximum, so I add a little subscript to it. And it's now just the mass of the system changing the properties. And then the people way before me looked at this and said, you know what, that's a new property. Let's give it a name. At first they called it availability, like the available part of the energy to do useful work. But then after a while it was more confusing, like available, what is that? Uh, so they switched it to exergy, and that's more commonly used now, exergy. So that's our new property. So it's written on a per unit mass basis, and it's U minus U naught, P naught, T naught, V minus V naught, S minus S naught, K, P. Hopefully you have these properties straight. You ready to solve a problem? Write this equation down. We may need it in a minute, okay? Or it's in the textbook. Yes, sir. So to use exergy, does that mean sigma has to be zero? No. Or can the exergy equation We're going to get an exergy balance. First, we get the property exergy. 
Today we're not going to do an exergy balance, but next time we're going to do an exergy balance. And then basically you can have what we call exergy destruction. Uh, when do you get exergy destruction? Destroying the ability to do useful work. Uh, anytime there are irreversibilities. <laughs> so you're a, a lecturer too ahead of me. Anything else? Let's jump into a problem. You have three kilograms of water. Here is the H2O. It's sitting in a piston cylinder apparatus. Look at this piston cylinder apparatus. Can you tell, isn't this the traditional frictionless piston that can slide up or down in a cylinder? Yeah. Okay. So it's initially at a temperature of 180 degrees C and a quality of 95%. And it fills the piston cylinder assembly. The water pressure is constant. Why is the water pressure constant during the process? Because the weight of the piston on top doesn't change. Even while it's being heated by a flame until the temperature of the water goes from 180 all the way up to 200 degrees C. Let the dead state local environmental temperature be 25 C, the dead state local environmental pressure be 0.1 megapascal. Ignore the effects of motion and gravity, meaning forget the kinetic energy and the potential energy terms. And there's going to be a lot of A, B, C, D, but we start with part A and we say, what is the initial pressure of the water? It's a very simple question. Don't call it out. I'm going to pause. I'm going to walk around. And I want you, especially if you have your appendix, to either write it down on your notes or put your finger on the page that tells you what is that initial pressure. All right, so we got about five right answers, and it's around 10.02 bar. Somebody says, I want that in megapascal. No problem, I can do the conversion. Somebody says, I want that in kilopascal. No problem, I can do the conversion. True? How about this? Do you agree? Give me a thumbs up visually if it's 1,002 kilopascal. Is that right? Yeah, all right. Where did you get it from? Well, the students looked at table A2. They came down to find the temperature of 180. And then they read off, that's P sat at function of temperature. So the saturation pressure, because it's two phase, is 10.02 bar. While you're on this table, we're going to need information. We're going to need to probably get the specific volume initial. Okay. Well, the specific volume initial is going to use V sub F and V sub G, is it not? Oh, I forgot. What is the equation for calculating the specific volume given temperature and quality? Can you write that equation down? Don't call it out. I'm going to walk around and see if you can write that equation down. So the equation I was looking for is uh, V sub F plus the quality times V sub G minus V sub F. Got it? Yeah. And you know what? Not only am I going to need to calculate V at the initial state, probably U at the initial state, probably S at the initial state, but guess what? I'm going to use the U sub F and U sub G just like that. Isn't it going to be U sub F plus the quality times U sub G minus U sub F? And then isn't S of F plus the quality times S of G minus S of F? True. So we're going to need these for parts B, C, and D. But for part A, we just needed to get the saturation pressure. Okay. How about for part B? What is the change in the internal energy of the water? What is an equation for the change in the internal energy of the water. And would that equal to the mass times the change in the lowercase u or specific internal energy? Sure. And what was our mass of the water? Three kilograms. 
All right. So it's going to be 3 kilograms times the final internal energy minus the initial internal energy. It's undergoing a process. And we just said, hey, U1, we just talked about, that's going to be U sub F plus the quality at 1, U sub G minus U sub F. But U2, hmm, how am I going to get U2? And, uh, hmm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause for a second. I'm going to walk around, and I want a number of people, let's say five people, to give me U2 and write it down, okay? Write it down with the right units, okay? So I'm looking for U2. There's enough information here, and you can get U2. All right, so how did we find U2? Well, U2 is the internal energy at a temperature of 200 degrees C. Isn't that the final temperature of our steam? And the pressure. Now, the pressure didn't change. The pressure is constant. So a lot of people were saying, oh, I think the pressure of the water at the end of the process is 0.1 megapascal P0. No, 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 no. It is here. It's 10.02 bar, or whatever you want to do on the megapascal and kilopascal. It's a 1,000 a kilopascal, 1 megapascal. Uh, this actually lands so close that uh, this pressure right here, 10 bar, in the superheated table, A4, and what temperature do we end at? 200? And so is this the number that I was looking to get? How many people got it right that I checked? You got it right, right? So there you go. So, okay. No. That's why I picked this up. Look at 10.00 is close enough to 10.02 and done. Okay. All right. Part C. What is the change in the volume of the water? Well, would that cap V, delta cap V, would that be uh, V2 minus V1, which is the mass, it hasn't changed, 3 kilograms, times specific volume state 2, specific volume state 1? Hey, the specific volume state 1, that was V sub F plus the quality state 1, V sub G minus V sub F. We already talked about that. And guess what V2 is? It's the neighbor. Isn't that V2? Yeah, it's the in the same table. You had to find out where the final state is, but that's your V2. So when you do that, you find out that this is the change in the volume. This was the change in the internal energy, the answer. Ready for a part D? Guess what they're going to ask? Change in entropy. That's not hard, true. Well, we can do the change in entropy. Let's say that we can calculate that. How about the units on that entropy? Kilojoules per Kelvin, those are very funny units. Is that right? Yeah, sometimes the units can save you from a mistake. So try to master your units. All right, let's do part E. What is the change in the exergy? Everything up to this point was all prerequisite material. Now, finally something new. What is the change in the exergy? So, let me work it out a little bit. We're going to have uh, cap E2 minus cap E1, which is the mass times uh, this exergy at state uh, 2, which would be something like U... Um, minus u naught, but this would be u2 minus u naught. Um, let me do this. Uh, plus p naught, v minus v dot, minus t naught, s minus s naught, and neglect changes in potential energy in that. And we're going to do this. We're going to evaluate it at the final state, final state, final state, and then you, you uh, close the right parenthesis. Let me see here. Put it like this. Put it like, um, I'm trying to get the parentheses so they make sense. Put it like this. 
there. I think that handles the parentheses. Sorry for the slop on the parentheses. And then we're going to subtract the exergy at the initial state. Well, that was just u minus u naught plus p naught v minus v naught minus t naught s minus s naught. Close parenthesis, close square bracket. That's a square bracket. And this was all at the um, initial state one, state one, state one. Did I write that okay? It takes a while to write it. Well, guess what? There's some cancellation. We just get m times u2 minus u1 plus p naught times v2 minus v1 minus t naught times s2 minus s1. Look good? Algebra look good? And guess what m times the change in internal energy was? What, wasn't that 387.84 kilojoules plus p naught? Okay, what is p naught in this problem? 0.1 megapascal. I'm going to put that as 100 kilopascal. I didn't make an error there, I hope. And then I have M times the change in the specific volume. So that's the change in the volume. 0.064646 meter cubed. I saved more digits of these calculations because I was going to use them in the subsequent calculation. All right. And then let's uh, change color. Minus T naught. T naught. Okay. Uh, do I put 25 there and forget the units? Just ignore them? Or do I put 25 and say, oh, it needs to be Kelvin? No problem. There it is, 25 Kelvin. No, 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 no. Or do I say, uh, I'm going to convert that. I'm going to add 273. And so T naught is 298 Kelvin. 298 Kelvin times the change, and this M goes over here too, so that comes in at the change in entropy is 0 0.991815 kilojoules per Kelvin. That look reasonable? Okay. So this is, thank you for asking that question, because I wanted to cover the unit conversion out of thermo 1. If I have one kilopascal multiplied by one meter cubed, this is the way I learned to check my unit conversions, and I still use it. So far, I've made no error in this equation, have I? Everything on the right is exactly the same as everything on the left. And now I just multiply by one, and only on the right until I get it to what I want it to get. And so I just say, well, what is a pascal? Is that a Newton per meter squared? Did I just multiply by one to convert units? This is the way I learned to convert units. I'm just reviewing. I know this is insulting to some of you. Professor, I'm a senior. I'm about ready to graduate. You're wasting my time. OK, great. No partial credit on exam problems where you screw up the error units. Fair? Or do you want me to just go ahead and cover this? and then give you partial credit if you mess up units. Okay, let's cover it, and then we'll give partial credit if you mess up units. So Pascal's go. And then you say to myself, oh, what is a joule? Is a joule a Newton times a meter? So the Newtons go. And then I have meter cubed. Did you know that one kilopascal times a meter cubed is exactly one kilojoule? That help? My main question was you have 100 kilopascals written, but not 1,000 feet. Okay, what is P naught? This this right here. Yeah, so the initial pressure P1 is equal to final pressure P2, which is equal to 1,000 kilopascal. 
And then P0 is the atmospheric. Okay, uh, that's still a good point because you just saved a lot of your fellow students from an error on their exam, I bet you. Because they didn't probably notice that and they would have said, oh yeah, no, no, get straight. One is the pressure of the system and one is the environmental pressure. All right, so when we run the units on this, we get a final answer of 98.596, um, or you'll get 98.745. Both answers are in kilojoule. Uh, what do you mean I'll get two different answers? There is one number given to only three significant digits in this equation, and somebody would probably recommend putting it to five significant digits in this equation. Do you see the number? Who's going to volunteer and tell me which number in this equation is only three significant digits? 298, and if you put it to five significant digits, what would it be? Not 298, but... 298.15, 298.15, oh come on professor, you're joking me, 298.15 Kelvin versus 298 will actually change the answer at what significant digit does it change the answer? The third significant digit. So this raises a big question of how accurate is 25 degrees C? I know if they would have given me 25.0273 degrees C, I would have said, show me the measurement device that got that temperature to that level of accuracy. But even if I did trust it somehow, I would say that is a very precise temperature known to one, two, three, four, five, six significant digits. But we only have 25 degrees C. So, just to point out, when you do these exergy as well as probably what you observed when you did entropy calculations back in Thermo 1, that uh, rounding off on this temperature in Kelvin can be uh, error, lead to s significant errors. On exam, I'm not going to count both the answers correct. But what I don't like to see is somebody botching it so bad that they're not, they're not even agreeing to the first significant digit. Okay? All right. Um, well, Professor, what is the absolute correct answer? How about we vote? You vote? Would five significant figures carried out throughout our work be what you wanted? Oh, it's safest that way, especially in a computer and especially in your calculator. Run with as many digits, save them. And go ahead and learn the 273.15. You're going to be the safest that way. But the input was given to be 25 degrees C. That's really only two significant digits. So to push the final answer to three significant digits is already treading on thin ice. So I would say that, uh, to, that it's 98 point or 99, you know, like probably 99 is it's good to two significant digits. And there you go. You're pushing it to try and get a third digit when one of the most significant inputs is only given to two. But uh, run with it, and I recommend that you always report your answers to three significant digits, just as a general rule in engineering, and run your calculations to four, five, six, as many as the calculator can handle. <coughs> Any other comments? Yes, sir. So you would put 298.15 for the totality Yeah, I would have put in 298.15. But you'll see me in this class, I'll just put 298. I don't want to write all those digits. Yeah. So, Well, with that, next time we move into exergy for an open system. And before you know it, we'll get into efficiencies for exergy. Thank you for your attention. We'll see you later.